you can turn your cameras on. It looks like we're going to be a small group this morning, so we can actually have a conversation with, with the, the, the people here, but you don't have to. Um, oh, hey, John. Good morning. <laughs> um, we'll, we'll poke anybody else in as, as we're moving along and, uh, and uh, go from there. But this morning on our Coffee with the County Forester or Coffee with forestry professionals. I think we have to change the name, <laughs> Kathleen. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh -huh. <laughs> yeah. They, um, Coffee with. Mm -hmm. That's right. Coffee with. I like that. And uh, we have Joanne Garten. Uh, Joanne is with Forest Parks and Recreation in the Urban Community and Forestry Program. And I'm going to turn it over to Joanne and sort of let her tell us a little bit about that program um, and what they do and how they support towns, landowners, and, and those kinds of things. And, um, and I'm really looking forward to learning a little bit this morning myself. So take it away, Joanne. Thanks, Lisa. My name's Joanne Garten, and I am uh, talking to you from my house in Montpelier. Um, my office is also, or was also, or a bit of both in Montpelier. Um, and I work uh, for Forest Parks and Recreation in the Urban and Community Forestry Program, which is a, has five staff members, two of us are from Forest Parks and Rec, we're, we're in the forestry division, and three are uh, with UVM Extension. So it's this program that um, has grown over the last, I'm gonna say about 15 years, probably a lot of you know Danielle Fitzko, who was the um, program manager for many years and grew the program. Um, and now we, we work as a partnership. Danny is the director of forestry now, and we've, um, marched on without her quite at the helm, uh, but with staff in two different places. Uh, so actually, you know, with, with switching to remote meeting and remote learn, like remote sharing of our projects was sort of how we, we always did it. I'm the only one who's located in Montpelier. We have staff in Berlin, in um, South Burlington and Burlington. So our program does a lot of work with um, supporting municipalities. I mean, within that, there's private landowners, but generally our, our audience are um, both staff and volunteers at the town level. So we were just chatting a little earlier, Lisa was saying she was going to 251 towns, and I feel like that would be a really good project for me because um, part of, you know, as the technical assistance coordinator, my, my job now is to work with all the towns, <laughs> all the towns that ask, and the Gores too. Um, so, I've had, I took this position just about a year ago. Uh, I worked with the program about two years before that um, under grant funding for a project called the Resilient Right of Ways, which is wrapping up probably in about the next month. We've been working with towns on back road vegetation management and producing a guide on that um, that's just about to head to the printers on all the different kinds of elements and processes that are part of back road management. Um, but as a program, I would say we have a few buckets of what we hit on. We do a lot of outreach, both um, video and webinar and in the past um, in-person outreach. We have a big um, Arbor Day conference, the Thursday before Arbor Day, which Arbor Day is the first Friday in May. Um, and that has been, usually has four different tracks. There's technical tracks, volunteer um, tracks, people who are in, you know, municipal leaders. We obviously didn't hold that this year, but stay tuned for, for next year. Um, we also are, you know, we, because we're staff, have staff in the forestry division, we've got a finger on what's going on in the legislature. And certainly this past year, uh, the tree warden statute amendments, which are a proposed bill have been another piece of work for us and doing outreach and technical assistance for tree wardens. So that might be a kind of a neat thing to think about today and talk about is like, you know your tree warden, maybe you are the tree warden, <laughs> and um, thinking about that role in your town. Um, we also spend a lot of time talking about emerald ash borer and ash tree management at the municipal level, both with towns and, and their volunteer commissions, um, and with road crews. Spend quite a bit of time in the town garage <laughs> and talking to road crews about how they think they might start to manage um, dead and dying ash trees, and, and then similarly working with volunteers and the town staff to think about, you know, who, who's going to address these issues as you go from five or ten risk trees along your roads to potentially a couple thousand when, um, when the ash trees 
are dying are dead. So that um, has been a big focus of the project of our program in the last two years. We do have our own website. So even though we have staff in forest parks and recreation, um, we are the urban and community forestry. Can I share my screen, Lisa? Yes, you can. Let me give you permission to do that. Just okay. Give me one sec. I'll just show. I pulled up a couple of things in case it was useful. All right, I'm gonna make you, it's called a co-host and then you'll have screen sharing permission. Huh. Okay, got it. So hopefully you just see a web page that says Vermont Urban and Community Forestry at the top. Yes, okay, nodding. Yes. Um, so we just, uh, um, we're able to house all of our program assistance and resources and outreach and um, team contacts here on our own web page. And maybe the last thing I'll say for now before we open up to just a discussion is the Vermont Urban and Community Forestry program is staffed by five people, um, but it is steered by a council of 20 people. And the Vermont Urban and Community Forestry Council um, we meet quarterly now online, but generally um, three of those four meetings would be in person and would involve some, some field work too in different communities. And the council is made up of professors from UVM, city arborists, um, town tree wardens, volunteer, you know, town admins from, from different towns, volunteers, landscape architects, all kinds of different tree related professionals. Um, that helps steer some of the, the urban community forestry work, but ultimately it's, it's the five staff that are kind of on it day to day. So I wonder, I could talk for ages about that, but I wonder if we can um, answer a few questions or start a discussion. I'm gonna start with it. I wanna let people, you all can, can like raise your hand or put in the chat box that you have a question and we can unmute and let you talk because it is a small group if you all would like. Um, but the other option too is just to type it in the chat box if you like, I'll monitor that. But I'm gonna start off, you know, you talked about tree wardens. I'm, you know, I see the signs, I know people that are tree, but I don't really know what they do, how you get to be one, why you might wanna be one, and what are you changing in the legislature? Or what are you proposing for changes to the tree warden in the legislature? Sure, good topic. Is anyone in the group their tree warden in their town? where I put my foot in it. All right, <laughs> okay, so no one that we could see. Um, so the tree warden, every town um, has to have a tree warden. And it's one of those positions that if you look, you know, deep into the elected officials and appointed officials in the town, there's the, the coal weigher and the surveyor of fences and the tree warden. <laughs> so um, technically someone holds all those positions still in your town, the tree warden, um, does a variety of different things. And that really depends in great part on the town and then on the tree warden, him or herself. It's a volunteer position. Um, usually the tree warden has some kind of forestry expertise, but not always. It could just be someone who is really interested in the processes happening in the town. Sometimes um, the road foreman is appointed as the tree warden. It's the same person, um, which, I think creates a terrible conflict of interest, but that is the, the case um, in, in some towns. There are a couple towns where they've written into their, some of their town policies that they do not have a tree warden and those powers are passed on to the select board. Um, but there are technically 200 odd tree wardens out there. Um, so tree wardens are, essentially they, they plan for and care for and manage the public trees. Now, part of what we're getting into in the legislative session this year, it, it uh, began in the winter and now obviously on hold, but starting in August, is starting to define more clearly which public trees the tree warden is in charge of. So the tree warden statutes were written in either 1904 or 1906. <laughs> I can't quite remember. Anywho, a long time ago. And um, it, they were really written at a time when Vermont looked more like a village center and then you know an agricultural area and then forest and the tree warden um, was put in charge of shade and ornamental trees in the residential part of town 
So if you wanted to prune or take them down or have a planting program in your town, <clears throat> the tree warden would be the one um, in charge of that. So, you know, if you can imagine a village center, it's easy to picture what these shade and ornamental trees might be. They're actually on town owned land or in some very obvious roadside places. It's that like big tree outside the library, outside the school. Um, but what we also have dealt with <clears throat> with increasing complexity over the years is all the trees in the town right of way. So the right of way is usually 49 and a half feet wide, not always, but usually. Um, and it encompasses the land that the, the town roads are on, plus a bit of land on either side. And that land is still owned by landowners, um, but the town has an easement over, over that land. And so they can manage the trees in the right of way. So this is like primarily pretty functional, but as we've really loosened what the residential part of town is, you know, we're all sitting in our homes now, which are now also our offices, which are now also our everything space, you know, the residential part of town isn't a village center anymore. And that's created a lot of um, confusion about what exactly the tree warden is in charge of. So you can really picture, um, let's say the, the, you know, the sugar maple outside the town library um, is 200 something years old. It needs some pruning. It needs some care. We need to decide if it if there's any risk and we're going to take it down. And if so, are we going to plant some new trees? Those would be things that the tree warden is managing. Um, similarly, you may have a resident next to the village green who says, you know, this tree is such an eyesore. I want to take it down. Um, you can't just allow residents to take down public trees however they would like to. The tree warden gets involved, starts to hear all the different sides of an argument about whether or not a tree might need to come down and um, ultimately make a decision about that. So now that we're not exactly sure whether where the residential part of town is, um, some towns are playing it really safe and getting their tree wardens involved with the management of pretty much any public tree in a, um, in, in a right of way or on town owned land. And I'm, the example that pops to mind is the town of East Montpelier. Um, no, no one from East Montpelier, I don't recognize any names from East Montpelier here. No, okay. Um, so East Montpelier started about two years ago doing an ash tree inventory along their rural roads. They knew we've got Emerald Ash Borer confirmed in Montpelier right next door. And they have about 50 something miles of mostly rural road, town owned road. Uh, they got a crew of volunteers out to start inventorying the, the size and the location of the ash trees in the right of way, in the public right of way. And their town tree warden, um, this man named Paul Kate, just super involved, super into it, really wanted to you know, make sure that everyone understood the risks of emerald ash borer being here and um, get people out you know, looking at all these public trees as assets and also something to manage. They ultimately won um, some grant money from our program, which I guess I should talk about a bit too. We, we are able to give some grant money out um, and started to take, uh, proposed to take down some ash trees in the public right of way along three of their roads. So these are publicly managed trees and they, their tree warden could have said, you know, these, this is not the residential part of town. This is just one of our roads. The town is making a decision to, to take down some of these trees end of story. But they decided to still hold a public hearing, which is something that the tree warden needs to do if he or she um, is thinking about taking down public trees that are publicly managed or on public land. So they did that. We had a, a presentation about what EAB is, and then the tree warden stood up there and, and kind of organized this meeting where people could ask questions and voice their concerns um, or their support for, for taking down these ash trees. And then ultimately we brought a decision to the select board that they were able to proceed with one caveat for one landowner who had some concerns about sensitive habitat um, bordering her property. So that's a, like an example of like a super, super involved tree warden who was really with the support of other volunteers was really uh, wanting to make sure that the public had input on what he was considering public trees. Um, so some of the changes that are proposed for the, these statutes, they were amended in 1969 slightly, but other than that, they pretty much stand as written from the early 1900s. And so the part of the issue is that this definition of shade or ornamental trees and 
in the residential part of town, both of those terms are not defined. <laughs> so that opens up a whole door of, you know, gray area. Um, and then secondly, there are other statutes that conflict with the tree warden statutes. Most notably, um, Title 19 gets into some of the highway um, statutes and it states that no one can remove trees in the right of way except for the town and the neighboring landowner. Now the tree warden statutes conversely say you can't take down tree, uh, shade or ornamental trees in the residential part of town without permission of the tree warden who may need to hold a public hearing. Um, and if you do, you're subject to a fine per stem um, of tree and depending on its size. So those like literally, if you're the if you're the landowner, they actually say the opposite thing. <laughs> one says you can gut them down. One says if you do it, we'll fine you. So um, there have been a really only one notable court case where the town um, in the town of Holland, the town wanted to widen the road, and um, they the town ultimately took down some trees in the public right of way. And the neighboring landowner was, was really upset about this and said like, I wasn't notified. Uh, we never had any time to weigh in. And ultimately um, the court ruled in favor of the landowner because the tree warden was allowed to authorize um, the town to take down trees if there had been a public hearing and the community agreed or if the trees are um, risk or hazardous trees. So there's pieces breaking off, you know, it's infested with EAB, it's infested or infected with whatever. Um, but the trees themselves, their actual location, you know, that that was not considered a risk. Maybe the risk is you driving into it, but, <laughs> but the tree itself wasn't posing a risk. Um, so in that situation, the landowner was able to prevail by saying like there was no public process around these public trees. Flip side is a, is a um, court case in process right now in Ferrisburg where a, a farmer took down trees in the right of way bordering his agricultural land like half a mile or a mile of trees there's something like 500 trees taken down of all sizes uh, without permission or notifying the tree warden in the town um, and like you know like anything in forestry once you take down the trees you can't glue them back on again so that was that when it was done and the town is actually um, implicated that fine on the on the farmer, something getting close to a million dollars of, of fines for taking down public trees. And as you can imagine, agricultural, the farmer says, this is ridiculous, this is my land and, and I want more shade on my farm fields. And so that is in court right now and not resolved. So this is like part of what these updates are getting into and saying, all right, what are we gonna consider the purview of the tree warden and what isn't? and ultimately is proposing, and this is proposed, so anything from here on out is not actually um, a bill right now because it hasn't passed through um, the legislature, that um, the definition of shade and ornamental trees be just changed to public trees um, that have been intentionally planted by the town or city. Um, and so that can be trees that have been recorded to have been planted by the town, or that the town can identify as kind of culturally important trees in their, in their area. So if you're thinking about, um, I'm just looking at the webpage of, of what I was sharing from the Urban Community Forestry Program, you see a couple of trees, street trees outside the fire station. Like those would be fairly easy to prove that they were intentionally planted by the town. Um, and those would fall under the purview of the tree warden. And then the towns have some flexibility to go out and and define other culturally important trees in their town, but that's up to them. It could be um, certain trees in an area, it could be trees along certain roads within the right of way, or it could be nothing. It could just be only trees that we can show were intentionally planted by the city, and that's where they leave it. Um, so none of that, it was, the, the amendments did pass through the, um, the house prior to the shutdown in, the, in June when the legislature actually um, pause for the summer. Uh, another thing that the amendments are asking for is some clarity regarding the conflict between the statutes and also um, requirement that towns report who their tree warden is. So right now, if you're the fire warden, for example, you report that um, to FPR and people know who you are, they know how to reach you and they know how to um, provide outreach. So for us in our program, we support, we had our first tree warden summit last fall um, but we don't know who the tree warden is <laughs> unless we happen to find them. And so 
uh, one of our staff spent a morning calling 200 odd town administrators to ask who's your tree warden and what's their phone number <laughs> and um, as you can imagine that goes out of date pretty quickly and um, is sort of inefficient so, so we're looking for some ways to make that reportable to forest parks and rec um, again for the purposes of like connection and outreach and training there's no other states have like tree warden school i think connecticut rhode island you, you take these courses and you you know become educated not so much in how to care for trees but how that works for policies in your in your town what that means we don't have anything like that in vermont and i I can't imagine that we will anytime soon, but still, you know, being able to reach the tree wardens, being able to update them on changes in legislature, examples of what's going on with other tree wardens, um, and also just connecting them to each other. At our one summit we held in Berlin last fall, we had about 60 people there, 60 tree wardens. And part of that was just like breakout groups and getting people to know, particularly geographically, who their neighboring tree wardens are. So that is the very long version of, of who tree wardens are. Um, and you can you know, call your town office and ask who your tree warden is, or you may know that person. Um, there may be a vacancy and you wanna to fill that. I'm pretty sure we have, we put that list. Um, yeah, Vermont tree wardens, resources for tree wardens. So this is definitely part of our program of, of um, supporting tree wardens, doing what we can to share the technical information. Um, and this kind of gets into a bunch of commonly asked questions, including about the tree warden statutes. We do keep an active page of um, the proposed tree warden statute amendments. So hopefully these will pass through the Senate um, in the fall, but there are, there are many things going on in the Senate this fall, so, <laughs> so we'll see what happens. <laughs> How is the changes or how would the changes affect the Ferrisburg case where it was the right of way? They weren't intentionally planted by the town. I'm just curious because obviously that's close. That's very close to me. In fact, you know, we know the tree warden in Ferrisburg. We know the landowner, you know, so. Yeah. So I'll add the caveat that I'm not a lawyer <laughs> and I think they have to, um, I would imagine they couldn't go with any bill that's moving forward as a, you know, go backwards with the bill. Um, if that had happened, let's say, make it all hypothetical, if this bill passed yep. and the town of Ferrisburg said, um, okay, we know that our intentionally planted trees are fall under this, that the purview of the tree warden, as a town, we haven't defined any other trees. Some towns will, they'll get a committee together and say like, look, you know, this stretch of sugar maples along this rural road is super important. If anyone cuts them down, our town will fall apart. Like we're gonna, we're gonna make sure these are part of our our municipal trees too. Mm -hmm. um, but let's say Ferrisburg did none of that. Um, then the tree warden, the the landowner, I think, <laughs> should, okay. should have been able to remove those without a penalty. Interesting. Um, yeah, that that's my impression, and I hope I'm correct in saying right. that. Um, I don't know what will happen in the court case. I checked a couple months ago with the town office, and they said it was still in court, and they couldn't yeah. comment on it. Um, so I don't know what what will happen, but you know, regardless of what happens, it's it's not the most efficient system that a landowner gets a million dollar fine and then, <laughs> and then no one no one can move in either direction. So, um, so yeah, I think that would be the idea. Conversely, I I can imagine several towns saying, you know, we want all town all trees over six inches diameter of any species in our right of way being under the purview of the tree warden. And they, you know, take that through all the channels in their town and that that becomes the, the precedent there. Um, so it's messy, it means that what happens in one town isn't <laughs> the same role in the next town. But there were a lot of attempts to broaden the power of the tree warden statutes and just say like, you know, all these trees over eight inches diameter in these types of areas fall under the purview of the tree warden. If you do want to take them down, or the town does, you, you can, it's just, there's a process to follow. Here's right. the process. Um, but that, you know, I think that was too broad reaching for people, so. Mm, interesting. So we will keep you posted. Certainly if there are, if these amendments pass, we'll have a, a pretty concerted outreach attempt, not only to tree wardens, but, but everyone to understand what the changes are. Right. Um, and even if they don't pass, you know, tree warden, resources for tree wardens are still part of our program. 
So what are towns doing? You mentioned one of the towns and the grants through the tree warden to, to do um, ash removal. What are towns doing about their ash? I know, you know, the forestry side of things, they're really trying to keep ash as a component of our forest. We want to make sure we leave males and female trees. Um, we don't want them just gone. Um, mm -hmm. what, are, what are towns doing? Good question. So we have, also pull up resources, community preparedness, Emerald Ash Borer. So Emerald Ash Borer preparedness at the community level has been on the radar of this program for years because um, we knew it was coming, but uh, it was only certainly become a much more active field since 2018 when Emerald Ash Borer was confirmed in Vermont. So I totally agree. There's so many reasons to leave your ash trees up in your woods. Um, and hopefully some previous coffee talks have talked about that a little bit. Um, and we certainly won't know which, which ash trees are resistant and what the future of ash is if we take them all down. Um, our message from urban and community forestry, where we're generally dealing with that place where people and trees are meeting, whether it's a very urban place like downtown Rutland or um, any of our municipal areas outside on Village Greens and this whole rural road right of way, which is thousands and thousands of acres statewide. Um, where there's a where there's a greater risk that it's going to fall on property or people, there's certainly more reason to think about planning ahead. And to me, it's kind of it's like picturing that. Well, if you know your, if you know that most of your water pipes are going to break, then you'll you'll make some kind of plan to address them piece by piece. And I think when it comes to emerald ash borer and ash trees, we can be fairly certain that most of our ash trees um, will succumb to emerald ash borer. Not all of them, but most of them. And particularly, you know, our streets here in Montpelier, all of um, Main Street is green ash. <laughs> That's the whole, pretty much the whole canopy. So when you think about um, if we did nothing, those trees would literally start to fracture and break in really unpredictable ways. And I think that's, that's a big takeaway of our, our message is that ash trees that are um, dying from an emerald ash borer infestation are really brittle. They're really unpredictable. They're really unsafe. Even if you decide to take them down at ground level, they may fracture 20 feet up in the air and, and fall in different ways. Um, so really where there are people and property and cars, um, starting to think about Proactive management is not a bad idea. <laughs> and uh, so we offer um, different trainings on doing ash, roadside ash inventories. And it's, it's fairly straightforward in terms of the type of data you're collecting. First of all, know how to identify an ash, which is um, to some people, the back of their hand, no big deal. To other people, they have no idea which one the ash is. And so that's where we'll, we'll go out and start with volunteers. Um, being able to understand where they are, like are they, um, in an urban area? Are they in the municipal right-of-way? Because remember the land and the wood belongs to the landowner in the right-of-way, but the management rights belong to the town. So if this tree is falling apart and, and posing a risk, it becomes a management issue for the town. So towns are doing, starting by doing inventories, they're doing that either with like pen and paper and map, or we also have an app because there's an app for everything, and we have a collector project and folks go out and, and um, identify the location, the size, the diameter, just within a couple of buckets, like zero to 12 inches, 12 to 24 inches diameter, and anything bigger. Uh, the very basic health of the tree, you know, looks in good shape or it's dead, <laughs> and anything you want in between, but those are sort of the two options. Um, and then um, noting what kind of management that tree would have. Is it in the municipal right-of-way, so it's a right-of-way tree and the town is responsible for managing it. Is it in the utility right-of-way? So that's another conversation. The utility has its own right-of-way along the road. Sometimes that intersects with the town right-of-way. Who's going to get there first to manage the trees? And then of course the utility line, it's, it's um, much more dangerous to be thinking about taking down trees there. Um, and then lastly, some towns look at private trees. You know, the, the right-of-way extends about 25 feet from the center line of the road. But let's say you have an 80 foot ash tree, 30 feet from the center of the road and, it, and it's uphill from the road and it will fall down. Like some towns are starting to think about, should we reach out to that landowner um, and, and either think about treating ash trees uh, with an insecticide, 
which is a completely viable option, particularly in some of these, like in downtown Montpelier again, where all of our shade trees are, main, are green ash, the town will be treating some of those, um, some for a certain, for 10 years, 15 years, as we essentially phase in and phase out other, other trees. Um, and other towns are considering that for some of their really important trees. I'll, I'll back up again to East Montpelier because I spent a bunch of time there. You drive up um, out of Montpelier, this road called North Street, and you head like straight up. You end up at a farm field uh, with these incredible views of, um, of the Worcester range. And then you can see Camel's Hump from the background. And everyone just drives up there and goes for an evening walk. It's just like a thing that we do here. <laughs> and, and the place to park, there's two little pull-offs. And both next to both of those pull-offs, um, our two, our, each one is a giant ash tree. <laughs> and so just random chance that those big shade trees are ash. They're in the municipal right of way. And those are trees actually that the town is considering treating with an insecticide because they're just these like cultural markers in the town um, that they want to keep for the, for the foreseeable future. Um, but that's, that's a little more rare. You, you can imagine if your town has 2,000, 3,000 ash trees in the right of way, you're probably not going to march down the road and treat all of them. <laughs> so um, so once towns have an idea of what, what they're dealing with, what scope of, of ash trees they're dealing with, some are starting to consider removal. Your neighbor um, in Charlotte, uh, Lisa, they've been on really proactive about emerald ash borer management and have actually released a couple of bids and hired um, some contractors to remove ash trees along certain stretches of road. And you can imagine it's not cheap. Um, our program is, is giving out grants, um, competitive grants. We actually just released a new round of grant application. It felt really good to have money to give out at <laughs> this time. Um, and I'll, I'll just pull that up. I think it's actually on our homepage. It's these ash tree management grants. Um, this is the second round of larger grants we've been able to um, put out our competitive applications for. They're gonna be between, for between five and fifteen thousand um, dollars grant money, which requires a match from the town, either in kind or or financial, um, and it allow it does fund ash tree removals um, in in the municipal right of way in on public land on town land. Um, it has a required planting component, not necessarily in the right of way, and certainly not ash trees, but planting somewhere in your town could be in a schoolyard, could be along a river, could be really anywhere where there's a, a need for some kind of tree planting. And then also supports other kind of ash management work like ash inventory on trails in town forests or popular parking areas where there's um, a town forest or another trail, you know, other areas where you're looking at high use municipal land. Um, so I think in our um, database, of towns that have used this electronic app to do their roadside ash inventory. I'm estimating since I last checked, we've probably got about 30, maybe 30, up to 35 towns that have used this um, digital version to do their, their ash inventory. And I'll, I'll just go, uh, go in the back end here as soon as that thing goes away. Um, to see if I can pull it up. I would say we've got 30,000 data points <laughs> where maybe not every single data point is one tree. It could be even more than one tree. Um, but we're looking at, honestly, tens of thousands of ash trees um, in municipally owned or municipally managed land. Okay, 39,724 data points. Some mm -hmm. of those may have more than one, um, may have more than one tree in that data point. There may be a couple of stems, but let's say roughly, you know, 42,000 ash trees. And this is the back end. This is not, this is a, a secret I'm sharing. You wouldn't normally see this <laughs> yourself on our website. We have some other more outward facing pages. Um, but you can see, you know, all the different towns that have, to some extent, done some ash inventory work. Um, some are done. They've counted 3,000 trees. Some did one road one afternoon and there's 50 trees. You know, it totally depends. Um, so yeah, all that being said, we're just able to start supporting um, some ash tree planning. Um, the, the brunt of the cost of 
municipal ash tree management will fall to the towns. There is not a magic pot of money coming from the federal government. We are super late to the party when it comes to national EAB management. Like the, the funding that went into figuring out what to do 15 years ago um, is not there anymore. And I, I keep hearing that emerald ash borer will become a deregulated pest. And that essentially for, for us means that any kind of federal aid or, or help with managing it is really, you know, falls to, to us, to municipalities and to private landowners. Mm -hmm. um, so although we're able to give out say $15,000 in grant money, which is a great start, um, that may fund, you know, treatment along a mile and a half of road, plus some planting, plus some outreach. Um, and, you know, one of the things that our grants are supporting now is effective and innovative use of this ashwood. Like what's the second life? You can just take it down and chip it if you like, but maybe there's something else happening in your town. There's a firewood program, there's a furniture maker, there's you know, <laughs> someone who's making a new floor. <laughs> so interesting. Yeah, so that, um, that is really a, been a huge part of my work is helping towns wrap their head around managing ash trees, managing these municipal ash trees. A number of years ago when I was at a conference out in Minnesota, um, when EAB was sort of just kicking in and, and we were really just getting to know them there, there was a, a furniture company called From the Ashes. Oh, yeah. Oh, that was pretty cool. Smart. Yeah. Um, <laughs> John Bowen has his hand raised on his, his uh, screen. So I'm going to see if he wants to click off his mute button and ask his question. Got it. Done. Thanks. <laughs> um, I, um, <clears throat> so I'm in the town of Hartford and we have a town forest and um, uh, the urban community forestry program in the past has been very generous. Uh, we were one of the town forests that, that got one of the recreation grants um, three or four years ago. Um, so I know that the Urban Community Forestry Program is involved in recreation and trying to make that work. Um, yesterday, I watched a, um, a video presentation that was by Jim Oher, I think, is with um, New Hampshire's Fish and Game Department. Um, and he has put together a program in New Hampshire where they are using GIS to help identify where trails might go, where they should, where good locations for trails. Um, and at the same time, it obviously would indicate where bad locations of trails are. Um, I am sort of interested in wondering whether that sort of process using GIS might be implemented in Vermont. Um, so as I said, they've got sort of a program going on there and they've, they've They've got a system whereby they can go onto their state GIS website, like our um, um, agency of Nat <clears throat> agency of natural resources um, atlas. Atlas, then, yeah, yeah, and then pull that, pull that, pull those, put those pieces together, um, so that individual towns or individual landowners um, could get some, basically get to look at overlays and. Um, with heat maps, um, you know, green, yellow, red, to try to um, figure out where it might be good places to put trails and good places to not have trails. Any, any thoughts about that? Yeah, a couple thoughts, um, but reasonably quick ones, I think. Um, John brought up a really good point of kind of all the various things that our program does is town forest recreation planning has been a big focus. Um, namely, you probably worked with Kate Forer then, yeah. who was um yeah okay who was heading that part of our um let me see just in our list here programs is a lot of the the town forest work we came up with a new town forest recreation guidance document i'm not finding it quickly while everyone's watching me but um <laughs> the <laughs> the in terms of doing um remote work to locate trails that's not something that i know about I can suggest two things though. Um, first is asking Kate, and I can do that and pass that back to you um, if that's something that they've worked on. Um, it's something that I, I could imagine private companies offering. Uh, when you were mentioning some of the heat mapping, it actually made me think about uh, how some people are starting to do their roadside ash inventory or ash inventory in general remotely using like heat mapping 
drone flyover, all kinds of different like um, spectral signatures of detecting ash as opposed to anything else. Um, so I don't know if something that all of that though I know about is through private consulting groups that are that are pulling that off and, and giving that a go. Um, so I guess I don't have a great answer except that I can ask Kate about that and then also um, the recreation division in Forest Parks and Rec um, may be a little more involved in that trail mapping. John, so I, I had think... kind of an ulterior motive in, oh, in asking that question. Okay. <laughs> um, and, and, and I think Lisa may be seeing it coming. Um, I'm sort of wondering whether this would be a reasonable natural resources related grant that Vermont Coverts, um, Urban Community Forestry, Fish and Wildlife, um, Vermont Woodlands might get interested in doing. Um, living in Hartford, we're seeing quite a significant impact on some of our lands um, due to increased use of recreation trails. And um, uh, recreation is wonderful. We should be doing it. Um, it's, we need to get people out. It's, we, we want to invite people to get out into the forest because if they don't see the forest, they don't love the forest, um, we ultimately will lose it and our lives depend on it. Um, so I just sort of interested in sort of putting that out there as a, per perhaps an opportunity. To do some mapping work for new trails. Yeah, the program itself is the or or putting the process together so that you know basically borrowing it, transferring it from New Hampshire into Vermont from the New Hampshire granite GIS system into the Vermont Atlas. Joanne, so there was a um, actually this was the second time that Jim did this program, and I saw it the first time, John, and was fascinated by it as well. And it really takes into account wildlife use. It, it's it's done by the wildlife department, so it's a wildlife bent to the recreation side of things, um, and found it very interesting. Um, I'm not sure if our department, Fish and Wildlife Department, is looking at, at doing something like that with the JS, or if something like Keith at that level had, had seen it and thought about it. But I definitely think you're on to something in terms of trying to see if that um, already developed resources can be adapted to Vermont for use by our resource agencies as well as our private landowners um, as they look to, to make sure trails are, are thoughtfully placed and that we can uh, close off portions of trails that may not be well suited to the landscape, whether it be because of erosion or impact on wildlife or uh, somehow hurting the resource in another way. So I think you're really on to something, John. Have you all had a discussion yet or with or about um, the, um, with Jens Hilke from Fish and Wildlife, just regarding all the like biofinder mapping and natural resource mapping for communities? Has that come up in this series yet? Yep, we haven't uh, had Jens on at all, but we have talked about the ANR Atlas and we have talked about BioFinder and, um, and using other mapping resources as well. Um, this tool is kind of cool. I'll see if I can find the link to it and send it out to, to everybody um, for the, to watch this presentation. I'm pretty sure New Hampshire taped it or recorded it. It shows you how old I am, taped it, right? <laughs> no one taped recorded it. it. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and um, and see if I can can find that because it is an interesting one to watch. Oh, Sabine is letting me know they did record yesterday's, so we'll see if we can find it and uh, and link it to to people that are on the call. I did pull up. I did pull up the Town Forest Recreation Planning page. Um, it was 2018 and into 2019. This Town Forest Recreation Planning Toolkit was was a grant funded project that Kate Four headed up. So maybe that's the project that Hartford was involved with, John? Yes. Um, so there is a toolkit here. It kind of gets into, I wouldn't say it gets you as far as saying like, put your trail here, but it <laughs> gets um, looking at all the, the planning that you might do need to do to have recreation in your forest, the different types of resources. And this is a, um, a toolkit that's all online here at the, at the website. So that was Kate's um, brainchild over the last few years, and it's another piece of our program. <laughs> yeah. That's very good. The pods are very good. The natural resources pod is very good. 
um, in if, if, if people are looking to manage their their town forests, um, looking at that to try to figure out, um, you know, what are the values of wetlands, um, impacts of recreation, impacts of other sorts of, well, basically recreation on uh, on wetlands and and other sorts of areas is uh, uh, really useful. Great. Uh, Joanne, oh. so Tim, oh, Tim asked in the, the box, how much coordination is there between tree wardens so there's some consistency in how they handle various issues? Um, I would say there is not much <laughs> coordination. It is growing. It tends to be um, pretty anecdotal how that happens. Like just yesterday, I, someone was asking me about um, budgeting for certain things. And I said, well, this other guy did this in this other town. And then they said, oh, we used to use work together 20 years ago. And so like they just, it just sort of happens that people reconnect um, organically. We did hold this um, Tree Warden Summit last October. And that gave us kind of a, a list of about 60 people to connect them. I'd say generally though, it's, it's, um, it's informal connection and uh, through some resources that we can share. Um, I was also thinking of like coordination between tree wardens and road foremen. Like when you're talking about roadside trees, you've got one person trying to protect the health of the trees and make sure they're in the right place and that they're healthy and there should be more or less. And another person who just wants to get the equipment through. And I think that, you know, you can definitely see the conflict when that is the same person. <laughs> um, generally the road equipment wins, but um, but that is something that we're trying to encourage more even within a town and then regionally you might get some more cooperation around that. Usually the road foremen are pretty connected regionally. Um, I would say the tree wardens not so much. I did just meet the tree warden from um, either North Hero or South Hero. He's working up in the islands, but they as a region were trying to address some of their ash inventory questions. So there was some partnership there. Um, there's a group called RIPIT, Regional Invasive Planning Team, something like that. And that's based out of the Johnson area and Johnson Hyde Park, um, kind of a series of towns, four or five towns in that area have, have their own kind of informal group to address invasive plants and forest pests. Not a lot of coordination at this point. We hope to be that, that hub, particularly if we can find out who the tree wardens are. Um, we were able to put together a list of um, tree warden names as far as we could tell as of last year. Um, and then there's a, the town that they're from and then the phone number there is actually the town admin phone number. We didn't feel comfortable like giving out the tree warden's phone number everywhere, but um, so that's one of the comprehensive lists on there. So can I jump in and circle back to that urban ash tree? You mentioned Rutland very early on when you were talking. And <clears throat> I mean, I, I'm pretty familiar with that. I talked to the city forester and his assistant now and then. I know they did a lot of work in Rutland. What I saw was a lot of pushback from community members who do not understand what's happening with urban ash trees and the importance of being proactive. What kind of work is being done to educate the public about why you need to take that approach in cities when dealing with ash trees? And can you mention a little to the cost of treating ash trees? Because I know it is really expensive and I'm not sure what kind of funding is available for cities to do that. Yes to all of that. Um, your question comes at the perfect time. I Just in my inbox this morning was a note from one of my colleagues, Ginger Nickerson, who is on the Urban and Community Forestry team. Um, she's our forest pest education coordinator. And she was just letting me know that September 12th to 18th is EAB Awareness Week. So <laughs> there is, um, there's kind of a series of, of materials going out around that. Um, I'd say some of the most effective outreach at the town level, and I, this is, um, we should also ask a forest health professional this question, but those traps that you put in the trees, the green or the purple prism traps, they do attract emerald ash borer. They have caught emerald ash borer in the sticky traps, 
But I think one thing they really do is just raise awareness. You're, you're going by and you're like, what's that thing in that tree? And people have started to understand um, what the green ash trees are, uh, traps are doing there. Um, regarding the trees, so what happened in Rutland so far, um, Dave Schneider is the city arborist, I think, and he has an assistant um, whose name is escaping me at this moment. Um, me too. <laughs> right. <laughs> so, and we actually have worked with them on, they're on the council um, board, Urban Queen Forestry Council um, board, but there is pushback. It's terrible to take down healthy trees. We just took down one in Montpelier. It was a perfectly healthy ash tree, uh, maybe 12, 14 inches in diameter on city property overhanging someone's house. And it, I don't blame the public for being kind of upset about that. <laughs> so um, I think, you know, part of the outreach is just raising awareness about what will happen, about the safety concerns, particularly for the road crew who are often dealing with these issues in a very ad hoc way. Um, we have a million and one resources here on our Emerald Dashboard Management page. Um, including getting into the ash inventory options. We do a lot of presentations for municipalities, EAB preparedness for municipalities, where we talk about you know, what EAB is, why it matters, but specifically that a town has really three options. The first is to be super proactive and start taking down trees. And so Rutland falls a little bit in that category because they allocated money to take down trees, healthy trees, um, mm -hmm. in anticipation of Emerald Ash Borough coming. Um, the second option is to be kind of in the middle, like some, some roads will take down trees, some trees of certain size, some trees of certain condition, we may remove those. The rest, we will not, like they're on low priority roads. Um, there's not much traffic, we'll see what happens. These aren't big trees. Um, and then the third option is really just do nothing. And I showed you that map with 30 odd towns who've started some inventory. Maybe there's another 10 or so that have done a pen and paper inventory. It's not on our system. But that leaves like 190 towns <laughs> that haven't mm. haven't done anything, <laughs> and so, and that that will be the case. You know, most towns won't won't address this. Um, there's other problems. Their ash trees look fine, and we'll deal with it later. <laughs> so, um, that do nothing approach really, from what we have heard from our neighbors, state neighbors, is that that ultimately can be the most expensive approach because. There's risk with cleanup when trees, when ash trees fall, they shatter. It just kind of goes everywhere. You could be looking at more um, property damage or certainly risk to, to the community, closing roads. I think really regarding road crews, if they're going out there, some road crews are, are super efficient. They've marked hazard trees with their tree warden. They have a plan each year for which two or three trees they're going to address. Other road crews, um, I ask them, I'm like, how do you take down risk trees? And they'll say, well, we get the bucket loader and we give it a nudge and then we wait for a windy day. You know, that, that kind of way of taking down trees may become really common because there are so many, yet when they're nudging it with the bucket loader and it's an ash tree infested with EAB, it may fracture in a really unpredictable way and fall where they did not mean for it to fall. <laughs> so, um, so that issue of, you know, bringing this as a cost option that maybe doing nothing will ultimately be the most expensive option. Um, putting like maybe a first step is just putting some money away, 500 bucks this year, a thousand bucks next year for the town to have an EAB management fund um, to start to understand what to do. You know, there you've probably seen the, the fried egg map of where EAB has been confirmed around the state. It's not everywhere and it's not sort of advancing in a front across the state. There's time for a lot of communities to plan. Um, so we, we talk a lot about knowing what, what ash trees are there and then starting to put together a budget for dealing with them. In the cities, it's really expensive. Um, I'm trying to pull up something here. Rough estimates on costs. I hope you can still see this on my screen. Um, maybe a quick nod if you're seeing rough estimates on costs. And, okay. So um, ash tree removals will vary by the inch. And I have to say, I worked with the... Uh, Montpelier City Arborist last week to take down this ash tree and like he was the climber. You, you need to climb in the city or often there's nowhere to push it <laughs> to. Um, and it took us the better part of a day as a crew of three to take down one tree. <laughs> so you can uh, imagine in these urban areas that you're dealing with, you know, this 
$3,500 a tree, $3,000 a tree in the urban areas. Um, certainly, uh, so East Montpelier with their uh, pilot project, and I'm sorry to hound on them all the time. I just happen to have all their information like fresh in my head. They had a contractor, uh, several people bid to take down 160 roadside ash trees. Um, they went with the lowest bidder, which seems, I, I, I would guess still like a pretty low price. And they, it's averaging out to about $85 a tree to, to remove in the right of way. And that's, you know, with their equipment in and they're going down the road, it's not a one-off tree. And this is a more rural area. They're able to push it into fields. Um, they did not have to close the road. So that would be another expense. If you needed a flagger, you know, certified flaggers and you need to close your road to do removals. Um, and those are healthy ash trees. They're, you know, they may have had a couple of risk items about those trees. They may have been old or, or diseased in some way, but they, as far as we knew, they were not infested with EAB. Um, once, once you get up into an EAB infested tree, you're going to need a bucket trek. You can't climb. You really can't. That's, there's absolutely no reason to climb a tree that's infested with EAB. So now imagine that in um, a more urban setting. And urban can honestly just mean the ash tree is uphill from the house. <laughs> and so, and if you cut it, it may fall in that direction. Um, you know, you start to get into much more expensive trees to take down. Um, you know, we have this cost here, replacement tree planting. And I want to stress that, you know, we're not expecting any communities to take down ash trees in the in a forested right of way and then start planting trees in a forested right of way. Like hopefully there is enough forethought that went into um, protecting the trees that will grow up to be more resilient. You know, and, and they many companies are able to do that quite well. Um, really work on protecting trees that will become resilient canopy trees. Um, other companies, as you can imagine, it's just about speed, you know, run over what you need to and, and <laughs> get, get the trees down as quick as you can. Um, so that's a little bit about cost and the outreach factor is big. I know in many towns they've had set up tables for town meeting day. They've done some mailings. Often our grant um, money has supported some kind of paper mailing or some kind of stand set up. Maybe you needed $200 to make a display for town meeting or something like that. And that can all be funded through grants. But it's still a hard sell and it's a sad story. So <laughs> it's not something that people um, feel that they want to jump on right now. Um, and maybe last idea before I stop talking on this topic is um, some towns have done their inventory. They know that they're not going to have any money to do anything. But the one thing they did do was went down one stretch of road and, and marked ash trees with ash tree signs or ribbons or something, not so much spray paint that says they're going to be removed, but something that just says this is an ash tree um, so that people going down the road start to get a sense of what the impact will be in some communities. I like that. That's an interesting one because, you know, it's just, it brings it to your eyes. It's, it's noticeable. That's an interesting way of, of marking it and doing that. Mm -hmm. Well, we've rounded on our 10 o'clock hour. Um, it's been great having a conversation with jo you, Joanne. I learned a lot about uh, urban and community forestry. I've worked with uh, Kate quite a bit, and, you know, town forest and, and other outreach aspects, but um, I haven't really dealt much with this side of things. So it was very interesting to me. So thank you so much for joining us this morning and being a part of our Coffee With, <laughs> Coffee with whoever. Um, yeah. sponsored by Coverts <laughs> and VWA. Uh, it's been quite fun. And, uh, and we hope you'll all join us again. I think we're taking next week off. Uh, yeah. Then we have Paul Frederick on the 28th, I think it is. With and Emma Hanson. Okay, With Emma great. Hanson. Yeah. All right, awesome. And then um, it looks like we're gonna have Marcus Bradley, who's a consulting forester on September 4th. And then maybe we'll look at going once a month and unless we have to shut down again and then we'll go back to every week. <laughs> Um, but it's been quite fun and I want to thank you all. Kathleen, do you have anything you'd like to add? Uh, no, just uh, it's been great. I learned a lot myself. Um, appreciate you joining us, Joanne, and everybody else who popped in here. Um, always a good way to start a Friday morning. <laughs> yes, it thank is you. great. Well, thank you all and have a wonderful weekend. Thank you all. And you. Bye-bye. Mm -hmm. Bye. -bye. Bye.